Welcome back. This is your second video. Um, today we're going to be looking at crime scene analysis. This is going to be really key um, for what we're going to do over the next few class periods, um, and we're really going to make sense of that crime scene that we have. So our goals um, for this portion is to recognize, document, and collect evidence at the scene of a crime. All right, so we have two types of evidence. We sort of mentioned on this, um, we have direct or testimonial evidence. This is eyewitnesses and confessions and testi um, testimony by a witness about what that witness personally saw, heard, or did. And then we have indirect or circumstantial. Um, indirect ev evidence implies a fact, but it doesn't directly prove that fact. So um, circumstantial evidence, you can have biological Circumstantial evidence as bodily fluids, hair, plant parts, natural fibers. And then you can have physical, which is impressions such as fingerprints, bite marks, tire marks, footprints, tool marks, etc. Fibers, weapons, bullets, and shell casings and glass. Okay? Now, these are circumstantial because even though there may be bodily fluids there, that doesn't mean that that person was there at the time of the crime. Now, of course, if you have certain bodily fluids, involved in something like a case, like a rape case, okay? So if you have semen in the case of a rape, that bodily fluid is a little more than circumstantial, but it still falls under the, um, the guise of circumstantial evidence because it does not prove that it was not consensual sexual contact. Okay, class versus individual evidence. So class evidence narrows um, an identity down to a group of a group of people or things. So um, an example is your ABO blood type. So everybody has a blood type. They can be A, they can be AB, they can be B, or they can be O. All right. Now you can narrow down the population. You can say that the person has an A blood type, but that doesn't directly point to a specific person because a lot of people have a A blood type. Okay, but it narrows it down to a um, part of the um, of the population. That's called class evidence. And then we have individual evidence. All right, it narrows the identity down to a single person. And this would be your DNA or your fingerprints. All right, let's look at our crime scene team. Who is going to be there? So you have a first responder. Um, it's usually a police officer. It can also be a um, Firefighter, they are also considered a um, police officer. Um, they have special duties. Then you have medics. Um, they're usually second responders, and that's only if necessary. You're not really going to need a medic if somebody's dead. Okay? They're dead. The medic can't save them. All right? Then you have your detectives. You have the, the medical examiner. They come along if the person's dead. And then you have your crime scene technician, who's your evidence collector. Then if it's a big case, you'll have your district attorney. And then you have specialists um, who come from various forensic disciplines to um, narrow down and take the forensic evidence apart. All right, the first responder, they learn to adapt, okay? Adapt means to assess the crime scene and assist those who are hurt. D, they are supposed to detain witnesses, okay? Not just criminals, they detain anybody who's seen something. Then A, they arrest the perpetrator. So if they can identify who the perpetrator is or who a potential perpetrator is, they will arrest them if there's probable cause. P, they protect the crime scene. So they have to protect the crime scene um, from being messed with. And then T, they're taking constant notes um, so that they can provide feedback. All right, then we have the seven S's of crime scene investigation, CSI. So the first is securing the scene. It's the responsibility of the first responder the first priority, of course, is safety, okay? Is the scene safe? They preserve evidence as a second priority. Unfortunately, sometimes evidence, you know, isn't, gets lost because of safety, all right? They have to protect the area. They keep people out from, um, so that the crime scene is not tampered with. They begin keeping a security log of all people who visit the crime scene, and then they collect info and request specialists as needed. Two, the second S, they separate the witnesses, okay? You don't want the witnesses talking to each other because you don't want them to compare 
details and stuff. This is called collusion. Okay, so they want to prevent collusion. Collusion is another term that is used in academics when one class takes a test and then tells the other class, oh, that test was hard or that test was easy or this was on the test. That's called collusion. So collusion is a really key term, not just when it comes to forensics, but also to academics. The next S is scanning the scene. All right, forensic examiners will scan the area to determine where photos should be taken and where evidence is likely to be. All right, they may determine whether the scene is primary or secondary. All right, primary is where the crime originally happened, even if it's not the first crime scene that was found where the person was killed. And secondary is any other site related to the crime. So a body dump site would be an example of a secondary. All right, then they're going to see the scene. They're going to take lots of photos of the overall area from different angles, distances, and directions. They're going to get close-ups with and without a ruler. And then they're going to make a triangulation of stationary objects included in photo for reference. Next, they're going to sketch the scene. So they're going to create an accurate, accurate rough sketch, making notes, note of the position of all evidence. Um, they're going to... Um, they're going to measure objects from two immovable landmarks. They're going to la label north and provide a scale. They're going to list all objects in the vic vicinity should be in the sketch, so doors, windows, furniture, et cetera. And they need to include a case number, date, location, and a name of the sketcher. Next, they're going to search for evidence. So there's different search patterns that are used depending on how many searchers you have and the amount of area that needs to be covered. One person, you're going to choose a grid, linear, or spiral. All right, if you have seven, several pe people, you'll choose linear or zone. So here's an example, okay, a grid. You're going to go in two directions ending up, but you're going to go over the same points essentially twice. Then you can have linear, which you're, sent, again, going to go by many of the same points twice. Quadrant or zone, is um, you're going to split it up when you have multiple people to assist you. And then you have spiral. All right, the last thing is securing and collecting evidence. All evidence will need to be properly packaged, sealed, and labeled. Liquids and arson remains will need to be in airtight, unbreakable containers so that they can be sent to labs to be tested. Moist biological, okay, these things are going to have to be air dried first, then put in a paper bindle, which is put in the paper container. All right, so a ba paper bindle is basically a paper packet made from a clean sheet of white paper folded that the, so that the evidence can't escape. So you're, to do this, you fold, fold paper in thirds both ways. You place evidence in the center square. You fold along the edges over the evidence, and then you fold up the bottom piece. You tuck in the top flap into the bottom flap. Okay, so you can try this at home, but we will try this in class um, to make a paper. Um, all outer containers are sealed with tape and labeled with the signature of the collector written across the tape. This also this um, ensures a chain of custody, custody and makes sure the evidence isn't um, messed with because you can see when this um, signature has been broken. All right, and then um, an evidence log will also be put onto the um, all the evidence so that we know who has messed with it um, since it was collected. All right, your evidence log, it'll contain the case number, the item inventory number, the description of the evidence, the name of the suspect, name of the victim, date and time of collection, signature of person recovering the evidence, signatures of any witnesses to the recovery of the evidence. Search and seizure. All right, so the US Supreme Court says that um, searches must be made um, and evidence must be seized, um, that searches may be made and evidence seized without a warrant only under certain conditions. One, emergency circumstances, if somebody is in danger, if you need to prevent the destruction or loss of the evidence, or the search is made by the consent of the parties involved. All right, and courts now say that only one person has to consent. So search and seizure, okay, again, this is without a warrant, can only occur under these three conditions. So you will need to know those three conditions. Chain of custody. 
is um, keeping an absolutely complete record of every person who has had access to the evidence. It's not necessarily the person who has opened the evidence, but it is the person who carried the evidence from one place to the next. And this is um, be essential to being able to use the evidence in court, because if we don't know who had the evidence from this time to this time, okay, how do we know it wasn't messed with? Okay, so chain of custody is very important. So you're gonna bag evidence, add identification, you're gonna seal it, sign across the seal. Then you're gonna sign the bag over to a lab technician. The tech's gonna sign that they received it. The tech can then cu cut open the bag on the non-sealed edge. After testing, the tech returns the evidence to the bag and seals the bag in a new place and signs over the seal. Then they will sign the evidence log. So, um, example of an evidence log, evidence information, okay? And so it gives all the details that need to be collected. And it has a log for the chain of custody. All right, crime scene narrative. So this is a major documentation of the crime scene and it's written in paragraph form and includes a complete description of the crime scene, location, lighting, weather, evidence, everything. Um, things that should be there, things that shouldn't be there, but are, um, so all those details. And it does not include theories of what happened, just the facts. So when we were in the, um, crime, in the crime scene the other day, many people were coming up with theories. We are just collecting the facts of this crime. All right, this is just a crime scene that we are looking at. We'll make a crime scene set, sketch. Here's an example of the crime scene sketch. All right, this one includes a suspect, okay, probably because they found a suspect. Okay, our crime scene, we don't know who the suspect is. All right, we know the victim, we know the address and our sketch, who sketched it. You also notice that there is an arrow and pointing to north and give, should give a scale, okay? Um, and then the sketches can also illustrate where the evidence was collected. So here is some, um, an image that includes where evidence was collected. Um, a rough sketch is a representation of essential in information um, and it's drawn at the crime scene. It includes measurements, a legend with numbers, and date, time, address, case number, and then a compass. A smooth sketch is a very precise rendering. It is drawn completely to scale. All right? It is typically not done at the crime scene because it takes a lot more time. All right. To do a smooth sketch, you must use a ruler. You must draw everything to scale. Um, no measurements are included, but a scale is included, so it's easy to figure it out. Um, there's a key and a legend, and then, of course, all our background information. Forensic photography. All right. So for forensic photography, the crime scene must be completely unaltered. All right, the objects cannot be moved until photographed from all angles, and, all, and as items of physical evidence are discovered, they are photographed immediately in their position with their size and location relative to the entire scene shown. So you're gonna photograph from eye level to represent the normal view, and then you're gonna establish a progression of overall medium and close-up views of the crime scene. You want panoramic shots, you want evidence shots with and without a ruler to show scale, and you need straight up shots. All right, then you prepare a photo log to record all photos and description and a location of the evidence. All right, so to photograph evidence, take close ups. A ruler must be placed near the object and included in the photo. The evidence um, number tag must be placed near the object and included in the photograph so we know that we're look what we're looking at and evidence number tags, photo log, and an evidence log must match. All right, a crime scene reconstruction. That involves forming a hypothesis of the sequence of events from before the crime was committed through the end, the commission. And this is when you can put all the facts together and come up with a theory as to what has happened. Now we're gonna go back, and we went through this very quickly, and we're gonna do each step of this in our crime scene, all right? So we are gonna work through this. You're gonna try each piece. and Before you know it, you will be processing crime scenes completely on your own. All right, have a great evening. Look forward to seeing you um, the next day in class.